If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out of the box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi Amory Podcast. Thank you so much. I know we have one person who's a Patreon member here. Is there anyone else who happens to be a member of ours on Patreon? You too? Hi there. These two are members of our, our Patreon. That means that their support, their financial support and donations uh, helped fund this tour, and they're the reason that we're able to be here tonight. So yes. thank, thank you guys, guys so, so, so much. much. So much. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Okay, shall we hop in? Yeah, let's do yeah. this. Okay, so what are some of your favorite self-help books? I remember growing up, I read Chicken Soup for the Soul, which is kind of a self-help book, but they had like 50 other chicken soups. Uh Um, Do we have any like favorite self-help books out there? Four Agreements. Four Agreements, yeah. That's another one. Well, yeah, 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 obviously classic. (laughs) Which one? Our Bodies Ourselves. Yeah, very classic, very classic. I'm really into The Power of Now. I'm really into the Eckhart Tolle thing. Mm-hmm. What else we got? Uh, I read The Multi-Orgasmic Man. I don't know if anyone yeah. else has okay. read that book. That's some, that's some self-help book <laughs> there, for sure. For sure. Um, is anyone familiar with the title, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Yeah. yeah. Um, heard it. Has again. anyone read it? Yes. Yeah? Okay, Perfect. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I didn't read the adult version. When I was a teenager, I was forced to read the teenage version. <laughs> Um, the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens. Um, mm-hmm. And to be honest, I don't remember any of it. The one part that I remember is there was a list of 50 reasons you're not ready to have sex. Oh, God. <laughs> um, that's the only thing that stuck out in my mind. And one of the, I revisited that list today. I Googled it. Oh, really? um, the One of the reasons was if you don't want to catch HIV. And I was like, well, Jeez. does that mean no one's ready to have sex? Uh, like, yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Yeah. Jeez. Jeez. Um, well, and in case you're wondering, they don't have that listed in the adult version, at least not that I know of. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so this book came out in 1989, uh, right? Is that yeah, right? several yes. reprints since then. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and it's sold over 25 million copies. It has lots of buzzwords that are still being used today. It uses synergize. Effective. Synergize. Yeah, I think it brought synergize, oh, yeah, synergize. Into, the, into the public's psyche. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that this made us think about is a topic that's come up for us in polyamory and and also part of why we wanted to start this podcast is that for most of us out there, there's not a ton of role models and examples of healthy non-monogamous relationships. Yeah. That, you know, most of us grew up with, I don't want to always say they're good, but we had lots of role models for what monogamous relationships should look like. For a lot of us, it was our parents. It's also all the sitcoms on TV, parents, yes. Yes. right? All Every our books book. and movies, all yeah. our all celebrities, of <laughs> right? All of that. Um, and so, we kind of wanted to look at this idea of, as a non-monogamous person, we don't just get handed all those role models. We have to kind of seek them out, mm-hmm. which is actually like it's a little more work, but it's kind of an advantage. Because I don't know about you guys, but. As far as like an ideal relationship, my parents probably not the best. My parents definitely not. Example. <laughs> my parents were in an affair and had me, so probably not that either. <laughs> right. So, you know, not that they're bad people, but I don't yeah. want those relationships. No. <laughs> so we do have the advantage of being able to seek those out on our own. So what we did in creating this topic that we're going to talk about today is the seven habits of highly effective poly people. And we're not going to give you reasons not to have sex. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely not. We will encourage it, actually. <laughs> and uh, keep in mind, you know, as we delve into this list, um, a, a lot of these things are not exclusive to poly relationships or non-traditional relationships. A lot of these things are just for good relationships in general. So w- wherever, it is, wherever it is you are tonight, if you're single, if you're monogamous, if you're poly, if you're anywhere on that spectrum, chances are that this will still apply to you and hopefully help you to kind of have some clarity and some mindfulness about what qualities can really make your relationships better. Yeah, and so these were created from those role models that we've had, the people that we've looked at and said, yeah, 
even if it's not their whole relationship, but that part of what they do is awesome. I want, I want to emulate that, yeah. right? Um, or, you know, this part of my relationships have been pretty awesome. Like, how did I get that? Okay, great. Now, how can I take these things from the other people and kind of put those together to see so what were the like common... It's kind of like a Frankenstein's monster of <laughs> relationship <laughs> advice for you tonight. Exactly. Right. Uh, so with that, we're just going to start going through the seven, uh, and we'll have... Uh, you guys, you know, feel free to... to shout things out as we go along. We might have some questions for you as we go. Uh, but let's just get this started. Mm -hmm. So number one uh, is communication. And I know, like, as and I want to hear the yeah. groan. I yeah, as waiting. soon as you say that, everyone's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, it's like low-hanging fruit <laughs> yes. in the relationship advice world. It's like communication, communication, communication. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but what we want to talk about specifically is something that we've found in particularly effective relationships is not just like, oh, their communication's good, but it's that they're willing to use tools to make their communication better. Mm -hmm. They're willing to use systems and tools. Mm -hmm. And I think something we've run into in terms of resistance to this is people thinking, oh, well, if I have to use some kind of tool for communication, like using nonviolent communication techniques or using... Like reflecting or mirroring or... Right, any all these number, different yeah, things that... or anything. Yeah. That it means you've somehow failed or you're like, your relationship isn't good enough because yeah. we're kind of taught this myth that once you meet the right person, you don't have to do any work. Mm -hmm. It's all just easy. Communication is like yeah. super easy then. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, that is our impression when we first get into relationships. You know, when we're all drunk or falling. Everything will just click. Yes, everything just clicks because you're talking about all, you know, you're talking about bunnies and sex and how much you're attracted <laughs> to each other. And so, of course, it's easy for communication to be natural and just flow. Mm -hmm. um, but when you actually have to delve into conflict resolution, you know, that's when it comes time where, you know, maybe just your instincts about communication may not be the healthiest because... Surprise, surprise, those are also things that were frequently modeled to us by our parents. And even bigger surprise, probably also not very healthy. Yeah. At least not mm -hmm. in my, my scenario. <laughs> like right. So, so on the subject of communication, and with each of these seven tactics, we do want to leave you with some specific tools to actually use. Like an actionable thing. Exactly. Yeah. So the first of those that we want to talk about is using Agile Scrum in your relationship. Is anyone here working software development is, or is familiar with Agile Scrum? It's yeah, right. two. Okay. Anyone see uh, what's the TV show where this was on there? Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, Valley. Yeah. 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 They talk about Agile Scrum and that. Right, so basically... Can you, can you describe to us in lay terms what Agile Scrum is? <laughs> yeah. uh, no. no. Okay. okay, no problem. <laughs> can can, can yeah. you describe to us in lay terms what Agile Scrum is? Probably not. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, let me give you the super quick Cliff Notes version. <laughs> Basically, uh, Agile Scrum is this technique for workflow management for developing software projects. It was developed originally in Japan by some software companies there. It has been widely adopted in Silicon Valley, not just the show, but the actual place. <laughs> uh, and uh, basically what it's about is rather than saying... We're starting here, and in a year and a half, we need to have this project done. Here's all the things it needs to have by then. Go. Instead, it's saying, okay, here's what we want to have done in a week. Now let's check in in a week and see how did we do. Did we meet those things? Like, what do we have working already? It's trying to find, like, what's the next sort of low-hanging fruit? Like, what are the pieces we can do right now mm -hmm. to get this thing working? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's kind of a whole system around it. Uh, but we have an episode where we talk about this technique of applying Agile Scrum to your relationship. To your relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it doesn't sound sexy already, I'm, just right? wait. <laughs> just wait. And basically what that means is you set a regular meeting. You set how long your sprint, to use the terminology, is going to be, uh, which we recommend a month. Yeah. And it's you set a, once a month, you're going to have a meeting in that relationship. And you could have these in all of your relationships we have one every week for multi-amory. Mm -hmm. Dedeker and I have one every month for our relationship. Mm -hmm. I have one every couple months in another relationship, yeah, just because we're bad about scheduling. <laughs> uh, but what it is is there's this certain structure that you follow, mm -hmm. where you start by reviewing what's happened over the past month or week. You talk about uh, how did you do on the stuff you said you would do last time. Then you decide what you're going to discuss. You discuss it, and then you make action points. Like, these are the actual things we're going to do during this month or mm -hmm. during this week. And then you end it 
with an appreciation round. And this is n- not in the normal software scrum, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but we like to appreciate each other afterwards. Uh-huh. Yeah, but it's because you can because this can get really heavy. Yeah, like, yeah. The thing that the thing tears that can be shed. We've been tr- trying out this like agile scrum thing for maybe three or four months now, and and it's really fascinating. Is that in that discussion period that you can hit everything from like oh, let's figure out the schedule of when we go visit your mom to, like, hey, I felt like my boundaries were violated last week. Exactly. Um, to, like, oh, hey, like, I, I didn't tell you about this thing. It happened at work. You know, like, all in the space of, like, an hour. Yeah. Um, or I want to write my own play this year. And it, yes, it can be, like, a specific yeah, personal exactly. thing as well. Um, mm-hmm. and so, or when Dedeker's been traveling, it's me being like, yeah. I miss you so much. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh-huh. <laughs> And so the interesting thing is that, like, it, you know, it sounds really robotic. It sounds really dry. It sounds like, well, like, don't you talk about things normally? And, like, you do talk about things organically and normally throughout the course of the month, but it's kind of like creating this space for communication, for, like, really serious, really intentional communication and not yeah. just relying on when we have the time, when we're in the right mood, that these things will mm-hmm. come up. Um, and seriously, for as dry and robotic it sounds, like I swear by it now. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. incredible. It's been, like Amazing. one of the best things we've ever done. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Um, and especially for um, being able to kind of delay arguments, which sounds like mm. a bad thing, but it's kind of like if I know at the end of this week we're having a scrum meeting, like maybe it's something where it's like, okay, well, I know I'll bring it up at the scrum meeting, but now I can just focus on us just being together and happy and relaxed and yeah. not have to drag us into a fight when we're about to go out to dinner or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gives you a really safe container to be able to talk about these things. So mm-hmm. often if you're, like, in a very volatile situation with your partner, things can be said that you don't really mean. And if you know that the scrum is there, you can really take the time to think about it and then bring that to the table when the meeting happens. Mm-hmm. So, so to kind of bring this full circle is is there is this there can be this sense of resistance mm-hmm. to relying on a tool or relying on a system of mm-hmm. feeling like well that does that mean I'm a bad communicator because I need this crutch um, but if anything I feel like especially people who seek out non traditional relationships this willingness to seek out tools and seek out systems and seek out things that are outside the box is actually a great boon is actually a great strength. Um, mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you know, for most people in this community, you're already in a relationship that's outside of the box. Yeah. You know, you may as well make sure that uh, all your tools are outside the box as well. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Do we have time to talk about the Triforce real quick? Uh, sure. Real Go. quick. Go. All right. One other thing, and we have episodes about both of these if you want to check out more of it. Uh, this other one we call the Triforce of Communication. Legend of Zelda fans out there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and basically this is breaking down... This is based on some work by Kathy Labriola, uh, and we've adapted this for ourselves. And it's basically saying that all communication falls into one of three categories. And I know that's like a big simplification of things, but anything either falls into sharing something for the sake of intimacy, like I'm just telling you a story about my life so you can get to know me and so we can just share things together. The second one is because I want acknowledgement, like praise, or because I want support and just like, oh, I'm, like that really sucks. I'm so sorry you're having a hard time with that. Or the third one is because you actually want to solve a problem. This is where you want advice. Notice that those are not the same thing. Two and no. three are different. Yes. When you want support, that doesn't always mean you want advice. Uh, and basically the, the purpose of this is that if you understand communication falls into those three and you know which one you're looking for, you can actually ask for it. It's and called again, meta communicating, which is like communicating about your communication to your partner. <laughs> exactly. It's getting right. real inception on it. Yeah. Uh, and this, like, check out the episode about this one because this has also really changed things in a lot of my relationships. Mm-hmm. But it's often your partner will come to you with like, "I'm having a really hard time with this." Whether it's in another relationship, it's at work, it's with something with your own relationship, whatever it is, you can kind of pause before you immediately jump into giving advice or something and say. What are, you, what are you looking for right now? Which part of the Triforce is this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you just want support or do you want advice? And sometimes if they go, oh, well, I guess advice would be good, you're not like, forcing it on them. They asked for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And it's made a huge difference in mm-hmm. terms of being able to receive that in a positive way mindset yeah. 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 and usually we just have to make a note that some like, you know the classic example is a very gendered example of like you know the woman comes to the man with a problem and she just wants a shoulder to cry on and he tries to fix her problem and then there's and a fight she feels not heard yeah that's yeah. the typical gendered example i will say that um 
that does happen in my own life. It's usually reversed. I'm the one who, <laughs> if someone comes to me with a problem, I'm like, okay, this is what you're going to do to fix it mm-hmm. in, instead of, you know, don't cry on me. <laughs> okay. All right. On to Emily, number two. Number yes. two. Yes. So number two is sexually proactive, not reactive. So we've all been in relationships where, okay, we're dating a bunch of people, we're really excited, and then all of a sudden we get to a sexual situation, and oh shit, we don't have a condom, we're just going to have sex right now. Um, and the nice thing about removing barriers um, when talking about sex is that you can communicate about those things beforehand. Like, hey. What is your sexual history? How many partners do you have? When was the last time you got tested? Mm -hmm. The really nice thing about non-monogamy is that those are put into place. Communication is already there, and it's already something that we're doing. And so you're not just jumping into a relationship and saying, like, oh, I'm going to have sex with you right now. So the idea being that you're not reactive, as in it's not when you're, like, you guys are half undressed that you're, like, let's talk about protection. (sighs) Yeah. <laughs> Let's right. talk about the last time you got tested. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. That, like, maybe this pre sex safety talk happens all the way on your first date. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Y- you know, like, when you're not even in a sexual situation and not, and not like bringing it up because you're assuming that you're going to have sex, but finding a way to just mention, like, this is what's going on in my life. This is the status of my dating life. Mm-hmm. These are the people I'm having protected sex or unprotected sex with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this happened to me on a first date once where I didn't even end up having sex with the guy. He just brought up as a part of his, he had this whole, he was telling me about how he had had this whole, um, like, change like, in his yeah, life, that he was life. eating better and taking care of himself and kind of wanting to have more integrity. And he just mentioned, like, and part of that is, like, a dedication to having safe sex. And, mm-hmm. and like, he just brought that in mm-hmm. just to make it clear and put it on the table. And I felt like, oh, like... I feel so much better that like this is now open for discussion now and not when we're in the middle of the moment and like not wanting to kill the moment um, and not wanting to make things awkward. Yeah. Yeah. I've also found that uh, I did this, you know, on a first date, talked about safe sex and things like that. Just again, kind of working it into the conversation. I think it was like, oh yeah, recently for this podcast I do, we recorded an episode about (laughs) safe sex (laughs) and we had that conversation uh, and you know, she listened and was like, okay, cool. And then I think on our second date, you know, we just, you know, went home, didn't have sex that night. And on our second date, a couple of weeks later, I, I maybe brought it up again. And then she was like, oh, yeah, I did. I, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, and, you know, talk to me about her status of things. And we were able to have that conversation again before we were anywhere near the bedroom. Mm-hmm. And, and it was great. And it was fine. And it was positive. But it was kind of creating that safe space like proactively mm-hmm. saying hey sex is a thing that's okay to talk about mm-hmm. this isn't something we have to pretend we're not interested in and pretend doesn't exist <laughs> until it until does it's happening. Yeah. And, then, yeah. <laughs> and this includes also talking about things in the bedroom a lot of times um, it, people don't want to talk about what they do or do not like in the bedroom mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. this is being proactive about that as well like continuing your communication and saying hey I don't like that position or hey do this a little more yeah, and I think creating it fa- a Falls, space in that it falls way. into that same myth of like if, there, yes. if the chemistry is there, you won't have to negotiate what your sex is going to be like, or you won't have to negotiate It'll what feels good or what feels bad. It'll just happen. And good God, like for so many years, I have like squirmed and wrestled myself into weird positions trying to get bad sex to feel good um, because I didn't have the you know the guts to just say hey can we try this or yep. could you do this um, mm-hmm. and once you kind of get over that obstacle like you'll probably have much better sex yep. yeah I've, I've found that since becoming more used to that if I'm ever with someone who doesn't communicate pretty directly or or at least is comfortable explaining that it can mm-hmm. be a little a difficult. It can be like, can, okay, can I please get some information here? Like, <laughs> well, what? something something that's very helpful with that uh-huh. is instead of asking somebody like, like, are you having a good time or is this okay? Because right. kind of the default to be polite is just to be like, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's being very specific. It's being mm-hmm. like, do you like this more firm or more soft? Or mm-hmm. do you like this faster or slower? Like giving the actual option, you know, kind of beating the optometrist, as it were. A, um, a or B. Like, do you first or second? <laughs> yeah. First or second? <laughs> I've never, <laughs> I've never slept with an optometrist. Maybe I, that, maybe they would be I the best. I have in happy. an optometrist chair. Whoa. It's pretty awesome. Whoa. Everyone should try it once. I know that story. Really? Did he, was he very... Did, like, was it... it wasn't an A or B moment. <laughs> <laughs> this was before I had all of this knowledge just wow. in my brain. Yeah. I want to know more about that story <laughs> later on. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Moving on. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I don't want to move on, but, yeah. <laughs> but we will. Okay, number three. Okay, number three. Um, yes. We titled this, You Can Do the Thing, um, because Jace hates the word that I love, which is self-efficacy. Um, does anyone know the term self-efficacy? It's not no. really... Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. What? I, because only a couple because people Because the, the smart people hands. going to the conference know it? <laughs> 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 All right, Dedeker, define it. Okay, you guys, so self-efficacy. Um, it's a little bit difficult to pin down, but it's it's one part like belief in yourself. It's one part self-confidence. It's one part self-esteem. It's one part ability to just kind of bounce back from obstacles. Essentially, it's this idea that you have this trust and this knowledge in yourself and confidence in your own abilities um, to either accomplish something or to adapt. So it, the you know really simple examples, it could be something like you decide to sign up for a Spanish class, but mm-hmm. you really know in your heart, you're like, I'm bad at languages, like this is not going to go well, this is going to be a big struggle. And like scientifically, they found that chances are you're going to have a bad time in Spanish class mm-hmm. and it's going to be much harder for you to, to learn the language. Prophecy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Versus if you go into it and maybe you've never taken a language class in your life, maybe you have struggled with languages in the past, but if you go into it with a sense of self-efficacy, I do believe that I can learn a language, um, you're going to have much more success. And this applies to relationships, um, especially with any kind of relationship that goes against the grain, especially with relationships that are challenging. You know, people mm-hmm. who first delve into non-monogamy or any kind of non-traditional relationship, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of confronting emotions that can come up, you know, insecurities and jealousy. And so I think we found that the people that we admired the most um, who were in non-traditional relationships had that sense of self-efficacy, um, that sense of, I can do this thing, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. that sense that even though it may suck at times, even though it may feel icky at times, I know that I can get through this. I know that I can learn. I know that I can get better at communication. I know that I can get better at this. Um, versus, you know, someone who kind of goes into a relationship with the belief that, like, oh, this is going to be really hard. I'm a naturally jealous person. Like, this isn't going to work out. I that, can't do this. Yeah, yeah, it really does become a self-fulfilling prof- uh, prophecy. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think sometimes, too, it, it can take having had a success to be like, oh, yeah. you know what? I can. Especially when it comes to parts of ourselves changing. I don't want to say personalities changing exactly because I feel like people get kind of defensive about that well, idea. But you do have to sort of relearn some of the things that you're taught from a young mm-hmm. age. Yeah, and I think that we are always changing through our lives. Absolutely. Or at least I, I hope we would be. I hope yeah. I hope what I did, you know, the decisions I made when I was 16 aren't aren't that's me forever. Dear God, uh, no. <laughs> that, but that I feel like it makes me think of the example uh, Emily that you've given before on mm-hmm. the podcast about uh, so Emily and I were together in a monogamous relationship for 2 years before we opened that up to become Polly. Yeah. Uh, and the first six months kind of sucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't wasn't so good. No. Uh, did you want to tell that story about the, uh, the like the gut the... reaction that you had? Yeah, to it? yeah. Um, I remember the first time that Jace went out on a date with a girl. Um, it just it, it viscerally, I felt sick to my stomach, and it was really awful. Um, and then much later, I guess yeah, six or seven months after that, we were dating a girl together. And I looked over. I was in the kitchen making something for them, and the they were making out on the couch. And I remember just this sense of compersion, and it was truly there. And I I thought to myself, wow, like the difference in the visceral reaction between the two was astounding and I think I just needed to have that moment of realization that I can do this well and this is a thing that I can feel happy about in my life um, and it changed the course of our relationship from then on. Just to clarify I mean you're a bunch of you know poly friendly folk but are we familiar with the term compersion? Yes. yes. Yeah. That corner awesome. is. That side's <laughs> no? shaking the head. Someone's still okay. the head. Okay. We'll just say real okay, quick. Okay so <laughs> Uh, Compersion was coined by a commune from San Francisco in the 60s. The the Carista commune. The Carista commune, who were a little bit weird, but that's not about them. Um, (laughs) But it was uh, kind of a portmanteau of two words, of compassion and conversion. Mm -hmm. And they created compersion. And it's usually billed as like feeling the opposite of jealousy. It's kind of feeling happiness when your partner is happy, especially if they're happy, you know, with someone with someone else. Yeah. and to be totally honest, for probably the first three or four years that I was polyamorous, I thought that this was just, like, polyamory PR. <laughs> um, like, 
like I, re- I like I was like okay yeah I get I get logically yes that's great like that's great I get it like yeah I'll spout the same stuff back to my mom you know like I get it conversion 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 um until I actually felt it for the first time yeah. and it was actually a very similar scenario yeah. where I was watching a partner of mine kiss his other partner and it was like instead of this horrible nauseating sickness it was like fireworks it was just yeah. like this pure happiness and it was truly this like what the heck is this this is crazy mm-hmm. um so for those of you who are skeptics, it's a real thing. It does actually happen. <laughs> it does actually happen. Yeah. And in that same vein of having to have accomplished something to know that you can, uh, Emily and I, two years ago, mm-hmm. uh, broke up and continued to do this podcast together and continue to be like, oh, we're going to be friends. And I've said this before in relationships where it's like, yeah, we'll be friends. We'll stay friends, right? And it generally hasn't worked out. It's been a really trying friendship it's been something that's where you've eventually kind of like yeah that was sort of a transition to just never seeing each other again or saying hi at parties and whatever that was my experience of it it's always like the worst friendships (laughs) yeah (laughs) right they're really awkward but i found that the only conversations i've ever had about the the nature of friendship have been with exes huh right (laughs) your friends don't question that shit uh and i would say (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah And I would say it took it took Emily and I about six months. Again, I guess that's our magic like time frame. Apparently, but it yeah. took us about six months where we went to a concert together. Yeah, and Florence and the Machine. Florence and the Machine. Yeah, uh, and like as we were heading back from that concert, we're like, hey, you know what? This was this wasn't weird. Like yeah. this didn't suck. This yeah, was, was actually awesome. really fun. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like I actually feel like I'm closer now Mm -hmm. to Emily Mm -hmm. than I ever was before when we were together romantically. And I think that having experienced that has also made me believe that I'm like, any sort of relationship can become another thing. It helped me let go of some of that. Transitions can happen right? in whichever way. Let go of that old belief of like, it's called a breakup because it's broken, or Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Those Mm -hmm. sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On to the next one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh, this one's me, huh? Uh, yes, great. Yes, this one is self-awareness. Mm-hmm. So this, I think this one is another like, uh, sure, <laughs> I'll meditate every day, like, fine. Uh, but this is kind of, we want to be more specific about this, that it's about, you know, understanding your needs, understanding what you want, but it's also understanding how to take care of yourself. Uh, and, you know, what that means is like how to know how much alone time you want. I've definitely had times in my, you know, I'll have a few different relationships and work and this podcast, and I never have any time to just play video games or to just go to sleep early or read a book, right? Like, I would have these times where I'm like, fuck, I haven't read a book in months. And it's so easy to to feel like there's some nobility and self-sacrifice, that like, oh, well, it's okay, I shouldn't take care of myself because I should be giving myself to all these other people. I should mm-hmm. be meeting all these commitments. And what ends up happening for a lot of people, myself included, is that you end up just being so worn down that you're not even giving them your best self. Yeah. You might Absolutely. be giving them time, but it's not quality time because you're not quality at, yeah. that, at that moment. Well, I wanna, yeah. I, actually, I'm curious because I've gotten some really crazy answers, which I freaking love, but like, how do you guys take care of yourselves? Like, what is in your self-care? Other than... Yes, massage is a good one. Massage is a good one. What was that? Cuddling. Cuddling Cuddling. is a good one. Netflix. Yes. Right? Netflix Netflix and chill with yourself. Why the heck not? Anything specific on Netflix? Solitude. Mm -hmm. Documentaries. Documentaries. Great. Period drama. Period drama. Nice. I'm on on the video games train as well. (laughs) What was I heard another one? Dance. 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 Nice. Yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah. Five rhythms. Heck yes. Heck yes. Yeah. 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 Playing the piano, time. nice. Okay, oh, great. that's lovely. Got one right here. <laughs> okay, stop showing off. <laughs> um, so I think another important aspect of this is also being able to know, you know, as you get to know yourself better, and there's many different inroads to getting to know yourself, whether it is meditation or whether it is just time alone or through therapy or through any other kind of personal development work that you might want to do. Um, Part of it is also knowing what your emotional bandwidth is. Um, And now, very specifically for people who are seeking out multiple relationships, this is very important to know. Mm -hmm. Um, It's because there's this uh, phenomenon called polysaturation. (laughs) Um, 
which is when you're at capacity, like especially for people, yeah, especially people amount, who are yeah. very new to non-monogamous dating, sometimes get very excited, and it's like I'm going to yeah. date everybody in this town. <laughs> going on seven and, dates in seven days. Uh, exa- oh you God. know, I'm going to have five partners. It's going to be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I always toss it out to people that it's kind of like you can have as many partners as you feel like you can have jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Not that you know, not that your relationship should feel like a job, but it's kind of like, well, like in theory, you're free to have as many jobs or as many commitments as you like, you know, Mm -hmm. just however many is making you happy and is making the people that you're obligated to happy. Um, and then that's probably the right amount for you, but you also have to factor in how much time to myself do I need? You know, how much do I need to care for myself? That's a whole other relationship that needs caring for. Um, and so being able to have that kind of self-awareness to, to kind of be savvy to that, will help you to be a better partner, to not neglect people, and especially to not neglect yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, for example, uh, as an example of how knowing this is important, I have a partner who works freelance. Like, she's always just on her laptop all the time. You know, I don't know if any of you know freelance people. Uh, I'm I'm one myself again. I was one for years before. You end up working, like, 24 hours a day every day. Uh, So that's kind of what she does. But she also has what seems like unlimited free time mm-hmm. and unlimited like flexibility in when she can hang out and all of that. And so her ideal is to have someone around her all the time, like 24 hours a day pretty much, to be with somebody but working. Like I'm here separate and you're just here so I can do oh, that. So can shoulder and, rub and then, me. Right, just a little <laughs> shoulder rub and then, we're, and then I'm back, I'm working. That that's her ideal. Whereas for me, I'm someone who I like doing that every now and then but I would much rather have some quality one-on-one time together and then have a night by myself to play video games or even just with my roommate to play video games or something like that that's just like I don't have to... I'm not trying to be 100%. I'm just kind of being me, just chilling. Mm -hmm. Uh, That I want to have that balance. And so in discussing that, at first it was a little bit difficult, but as we were able to get more clarity on what we each wanted and what we each needed we were able to see like oh, okay cool like i do need to have more of this alone time or i'm going to get frustrated with you mm-hmm. and she needs to have that i'm around people time which meant that we needed to be more proactive about her planning that time with other people mm-hmm. that's not me and not just kind of by default assuming her plans are going to be with me and blowing other people off or just mm-hmm. not making those plans mm-hmm. so again kind of both of us getting clarity on that allowed us to get what we need, mm-hmm. whether or not it's from each other or, you know, what parts of it are from each other. Got it. Okay. I wanted to talk quickly about um, communication and being aware of your own personal communication style and how that also mm-hmm. will help things. Because yeah. mm-hmm. it, it, Dedeker and Jason, I talk about this a lot, but Jason, I tend to be what we coined, I don't know if we coined it. We but coined it. I, yeah, we coined it. Yeah. As spewers. And chewers. So Jason and I tend to like be very emotional and, and kind of have to get everything you externally out externally process. You verbally process. Exactly. You got to talk it out. <laughs> well, yeah. Dedeker likes to kind of like mull over something. She's a chewer. A chewer. So she thinks about it. And I'm in a relationship right now with a chewer and I am a spewer. And so <laughs> it can become a little bit challenging trying to figure out and navigate those murky waters at times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's good to be able to have the self-awareness of what you are and in order to kind of compromise your own emotions during mm-hmm. those times of communication or potential fights or yes. whatever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, just becoming aware of that, that if you're a chewer and someone who's a spewer starts talking to you about their thoughts as they're processing them. Exactly. To you, it's like, oh, these are fully thought out thoughts. Mm-hmm. Like, what the fuck? This isn't what I expected from you. Yeah, I know. It's the like, worst. What are you right? talking about? <laughs> yeah. Whereas understanding that they're a spewer, you're like, okay, okay, this is just part of the process. They're yeah. just getting there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas on the other side, it's like that, that a chewer won't want to talk about it. And as the spewer, it's you're like, fully formed. You're like yeah. perfectly yeah. Formed. why aren't you talking to Thought. me? Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't, yeah. I want to be part of this process. Exactly. So understanding that can give you both permission to, to do that. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of curious who, who feels like they're a spewer type of processor. That's the spewing section over there. All the, spewers. All the spewers. What about chewers? chewers? chewers Everyone yeah. over here. Oh, guys. How are you guys yeah. doing? We're outnumbered here. a lot here. of very intellectual <laughs> people in this room. Yeah. yeah. Well, Emily and I will try to keep our spewing under and control. Well, I, I don't like, know about saying intellectual. I don't, no, I don't I mean, think implying that spewers are not intellectual. No, that's but, true. Just yeah. like, of course. Yeah, so, okay, now no, we've pissed I, off the spewers. Okay, we got to move on. 
Oh, Sorry. Boy. Oh, boy. All right. Just saying the like, yuck. <laughs> we want to get okay. it all out there really quickly. Okay. Shall I take us to the next one? Yes. Yeah, go for Do it. it. Okay. Um, this might put me a little bit on my soapbox. Um, Please. Please. Morning, By all means. So, number five um, was a sense of compassion um, or a willingness to build a sense of compassion. Um, I feel like, honestly particularly in Western culture, particularly in American culture, uh, I, I really don't think we're raised with a big sense of compassion. Um, we're raised to be very independent, which is a good thing all in of itself. You know, we're raised to have big dreams and to go after those dreams and to grab them by the balls or horns or whatever body part you want to grab them by um, and make them their own and carve out your little corner of the world that's going to be yours. Um, and that's fantastic, but I think that kind of the dark underside of that is that it's also very competitive. You know, our culture is extremely competitive. Mm-hmm. There's, there's not a lot of emphasis on cooperation. There's not a lot of emphasis on compassion. Um, and when it comes to non-monogamous relationships specifically, like competition is not sustainable. You know, it's just <laughs> not sustainable. You know, if you're looking at a partner's other partners as your competition, yeah. you're going to be really unhappy. Absolutely. <laughs> like, you're probably going to make everyone really unhappy. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean that you need to be a doormat. It doesn't mean that you can't advocate for your own needs. It doesn't mean that you can't have needs. Um, but there has to be this willingness to bring the sense of compassion, to bring a sense of empathy, to bring a sense of flexibility. Um, You know, a standard example, something that happens all the time is like, you know, maybe Jason and I are just hanging out, Netflixing and chilling, like actually Netflixing and chilling. Um, (laughs) And like his part, like one of his other partners calls up because she's sick. She really needs help. Um, But in that moment, you know, if I see her as competition, it's like, no, stay here with me. Like, Mm -hmm. this was our plan. Mm -hmm. Like, you're supposed to be here. But... In choosing to have that sense of compassion, recognizing that this is someone who's in need, who needs something probably more than I do, that it frees you to be able to be more compersive. Um, and more flexible. And more flexible and more generous in that. Um, mm-hmm. At least that's been my experience. Absolutely. And I would say that this also can extend not just to those extenuating circumstances of like, oh, you know, my partner's in a car accident, I've got to go help them or they're sick or, or something like that. But it can even just be logistical compassion. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a, a personal example that happened to me recently, are you ready for this? Oh, oh God, okay. So, <laughs> you didn't prep me on so this. I, I, yeah, I know, right? Uh, so I, I hadn't seen Dedeker in like five, six months or something yeah, like that. She's traveling. been out of the country for uh, a while. Since July. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, since July. I hadn't seen her, and just a few weeks ago, she came back to the States. I got to see her again. Super awesome. We got to spend a week together. And then one week after that, her partner from Turkey, from Istanbul, came to the U.S. to visit for her book release and for all of that mm-hmm. stuff, who she had just spent like four months with. <laughs> And I was definitely brought up some stuff of like, you know, because she went and went up to came up here actually to Northern California with him yeah. and was staying with him and you know not not being with me during that time. It was this like, what? Did you, were, you were just with him for four months. I haven't seen you in like six months. What the hell? Mm-hmm. But understanding that like, yeah, I know, I get it though. But he also this was the one time that he could get the time off from work to come mm-hmm. from Istanbul to be here to support her on her book release. She was really excited for the two of us to be able to meet for the first time. You know, there's, there's all these other things that I was able to be like, okay, like, this might not be my ideal, but I also understand, and I would want the same thing if it were reversed, mm-hmm. right? Is that Having your spewing the... sound? <laughs> no, that's my, like, holding back the spewing sound. Oh, I see. Sound. <laughs> okay, got gross. it. It's like, oh, well, I appreciate you I holding just, back your spew for me. I just grossed myself out. <laughs> um, well... Well, another. I just. Well, thank. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, 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 you're welcome. You did well, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay! Awesome. laughs> I mean, something that Jace got to do was actually meet his metamor, which, if I don't know if anyone is not uh, familiar with the term metamor, anyone, anyone know what it is? Metamor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Your partner's partner. 
Um, so Jace's Metamor is Dedeker's partner in Turkey, for example, and they met uh, in person for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. And that kind of helps. I mean, we all have been there. We think about our partner's partner and say, oh, my God, they must be more beautiful than I am. They probably, like, are six foot two in a model or whatever um, and super intelligent as well. Um, and, and it's lovely to be able to actually meet a person and kind of put a face to a name and say like, Hey, you're a real person. I'm a real person. Let's kind of talk and meet one another. And it, I don't know, it get rid of all of those worries between each other. Yeah, no. I, and I think yeah. that's, that's actually, I really, you know, I encourage my clients. I do this in Absolutely. my own life. I encourage all my friends to try to actually meet your partner's partners, you know, and have your partners meet each other. You know, they don't have to be best friends. There doesn't have to be any expectation, but it does help with that compassion thing because mm-hmm. if some, as we've learned, if someone is just a concept um, and doesn't have a human face to you, it's a lot easier to be it's mean to them scary. Yeah. and to dehumanize them exactly. and to treat them like crap. Um, versus, Even if it's just in your own head. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Still. Versus if you've actually met them and seen like, oh, you're a human being like I am with needs and wants and fears and yeah. joys and all those things. Mm-hmm. So. Did I see a hand? Okay, I have a question. Yeah. How do you deal with power imbalance or like hierarchies of power when it comes to like my female partner mm-hmm. um, meeting a male or like, you know what I mean? Because Interesting. Because, like gender dynamics? Yeah, exactly. Like mm-hmm. how do you, like how do you negotiate the societal kind of welcoming of one and kind of like disembracing of another? I is it, I like disembracing. That's a new one. It, um, is it, it, is it, uh, I know something that I've seen happen with a lot of clients is where a male partner is a lot more comfortable meeting a female partner than meeting another male, male partner. partner. Is that kind I of the think, dynamic going on? I think it's more of the opposite dynamic. My female partner is more intimidated by meeting a male I see. partner. I Interesting. See. And I, can, I, I have to feel like I have to be able to understand that the power dynamics are kind of stacked against her. Yeah, of course. Of, of course. And like, how do I, how do I kind of bridge that? You know, what I've seen to be the most effective, even just having awareness of that being a thing is the first step, is a great first step. Um, if there's any way to bring that to a humorous point, as in all of us are able to like acknowledge that this is happening and laugh about it um, and say, fuck the man, or not fuck the man, but fuck the status quo, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that might be that might be a starting point. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I was just, I mean, yeah, this I mean, is it's a challenging one. It is something that comes up. A lot. And we, I feel like all of us have our own like sort of soapboxes that we like to get on specifically about bisexuality or pansexuality or anything like that, um, about this sort of inherent cultural belief that a relationship between a man and a woman is somehow more, more real, more, more thre- serious, more threatening, yeah. but also more serious, it, which is why in a lot of relationships, I think why you see so many relationships where a man's okay with his female partner having yeah. other female partners, but, but not, not other males. Male. And it's... Yes, the one Venus ball is exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it is... I guess my, my the thing I would say is just being aware of that conversation and having that with both of those partners, not even for the purpose of all of that, but just putting that out on the table yeah. of, of trying to clear the air about that, that just because... He's a man doesn't mean that this relationship is more important than the one with you. Or less Absolutely. important or whatever. Right. Whatever or, the or anything may like be. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is a tricky one, though, because it's so ingrained in us. It's yeah. in, in yeah. our... We just recently did an episode about polyamory in TV and film, mm-hmm. and that theme comes up a lot. Yeah. Of, of... These gender dynamics and power dynamics in gender. Yeah. Yeah. Between, yeah. 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 Women, of exactly. that, that somehow a relationship between a man and a woman is the most serious of any kind of relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Almost yeah. heteronormative. Well, you know what? I almost want to make an argument. What? That a relationship between two men would actually be the most like serious... In well, this way? it carries like the most weight, both right, positive and I mean. negative, yeah. especially Meaning in media like, right. portrayals, yes. versus a relationship between two women. Right. You know? <laughs> women can have their girlish fun, but if a man is with that another man... That tends to be the overarching, like yes. the portrayal, not exactly. the reality. No, but right, exactly. not the reality. Yeah. 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 Right, but if a bisexual those. man had sex with a, another man, it's like, oh, well, he's just gay and hasn't fully figured that out yet, or mm-hmm. he's transitioning slowly to that or something. Mm-hmm. But there is... Whatever it is, culturally, we we put this importance on male relationships. I guess that's what it is. 
Um, sorry, I know. Like this is you no. totally like triggered this whole thing that we talked about so much. It's, <laughs> it's great. An interesting one. That's uh-huh. good. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I would yeah. say that we're lucky in the Bay Area because mm-hmm. one approach might be to um, spend more time with your female partner in uh, in the lesbian community. Um, and, yeah. And you know maybe invite your male partner to you know come and be part of a, of a predominantly lesbian gathering where he's not. Primary, yeah. he's not in you know in his um, in his primacy positions. Yeah. Um, so that can maybe equalize that. You know, I I like he's the fish out of water, yeah. or the fish without a bicycle, or whatever it is that they say. I think no, that's fish I, with bicycles. I, I like the spirit of that though. That if there is something where, like you said originally, that kind of a power dynamic between the two, regardless of who it is. But whoever feels more disempowered there, it can try to have it on, bit, yeah. on their turf, yeah. somewhere where they feel more confident and yeah. comfortable. And the one who is a little more confident about the meeting might be willing to take that extra step to be like, okay, I'm going to go outside of my mm-hmm. comfort zone and my social group or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just a thought. Hope that's, no, hope that's helpful. That something? Yeah, good luck. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Does anyone else have problems they want us to <laughs> We're open. All of us. We're open. <laughs> Um, Should we move on to, to the next yeah, one? Yeah, let's go to number okay. six. So number six, having guts, slash balls, slash chutzpah, whatever slash you ovaries, want to call it. Ovaries, ovaries, ovaries thank you. What, thank yeah, you. what have you, ask, exactly. Has anyone come across the book That Takes Ovaries? Is anyone? That's a book? No, that's it's a, a book. It's a, it's a book that's just specifically a book of like stories of really courageous, amazing things that women have done. Oh, that's mm-hmm. awesome. I, I read it in college and was like, oh, that's Super cool. cool. Like, but it's called That Takes Ovaries. I'm into wow. it. Yeah. I'm into it. Check it out. That's well, awesome. I don't know if they have it here. We could look through you the have, no, exactly. You have whatever potent reproductive organ you want to identify. <laughs> exactly. Or not, whichever. Yeah, or guts or whatever. Um, and we like to use the term, be unapologetically poly. Um, or, or unapologetic. Unapologetic. Wow. No. I know. That, that deserved that. That was correct to say that just now. He's so proud of that one, too. I love that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so right when I was becoming polyamorous with Jace for the first time, I told my mother about it, and I was like, well... Like gonna... 30 seconds later, yeah, you told exactly. your mother about it. Yeah, exactly. Because we talk about everything, and and I was like, well, Mom, we're going we're gonna, to you know, start dating multiple people, and I'm going to date him, and he's going to date me, but we're each going to date other people as well. And she just kind of called me on my bullshit. She's like, you have no conviction about this. And it, it, I was pissed at the time, but looking back, she was absolutely correct. Um, and now, obviously, I help run a podcast on polyamory, so I better have some balls about it, um, or ovaries, as it were. But yeah, I mean, I think we definitely tell people to be as unapologetic about it as you possibly can. Because say to people like, hey, this is what I am, this is what I'm doing, and be okay with it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, don't don't worry that, I don't know, I mean, everyone is going to have their opinions, mm-hmm. and everyone at one point is going to say, no, I don't like that, or yeah. that's fucked up, or whatever. That was, um, I mean, that was a big part of my own journey yeah. is that I spent three or four years and I call it my trial and error period, but it was more like my failure and bigger failure period <laughs> right. um, yeah. where I was very apologetic about wanting something that wasn't monogamy. You know, I was still kind of feeling out it, what exact flavor of non-traditional relationship I wanted, but I was extremely ashamed of it. Like yeah. I wouldn't be totally upfront with people on first dates that that's what I was looking for. You know, it took me forever to come out to people. Yeah. Um, I was really, really scared of rejection. Mm-hmm. You know, like I just couldn't stand the idea of going on a date with someone and like maybe telling them about this weird relationship thing that I'm interested in is going to make them reject me. And so, and so like, I don't know no what my way. end game was. I just thought like I didn't think it all the way through, and yeah. it ended in like a lot of heartbreak and a yeah. lot of disappointment on both sides. Um, mm-hmm. But it was the moment, like about three or four years in, like the moment that I finally was like, okay. Like, I'm going to take ownership of this now. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm just going to say, like, this is what I want. I'm going to be upfront with people. I'm going to be unapologetic. Um, you were so close. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> to the world and to any prospective dating partner that this is what I want. And that was finally the moment when, surprise, like, actually people who wanted the same thing found me. Yeah. Um, I can't say that after that moment everything was perfect and, like, nothing ever felt wrong ever again or, like, I never made any more mistakes. But that was finally the moment where it was finally, like, so much love and so much happiness and so much trust and so many good, good relationships and so many really good lessons actually came into my life was finally the moment that I, that I got some guts and said like, you know what? Yes. Like this is what I want. This is what I'm doing. Um, yeah. And, and I would take that even a step further from just saying right at the beginning, like, Hey, I'm, I, I want to have polyamorous relationships or ethically non-monogamous or whatever term you want to use for it. But also, in terms of how you talk to the, how you talk to people in your relationships even after that point uh, this is something i i found comes up a lot when you're dating someone who's new to polyamory uh who is right who who maybe they've heard a little bit about it but this is their first time trying it or maybe you're the very first person that blew their mind that this was even a, a thing that existed <laughs> right that there's this temptation and I think part of it comes from that fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. And also part of it comes from this idea that, like, well, if I ease them into it, they're going to be more into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really that's, where this, that's where this concept of being unapologetic. Ha. God damn it, uh, Every time. I'm going to keep using it until you're until, numb to until it. Until there's no <laughs> Until you try and you're just going to go home and start using it like it's a normal word, <laughs> and I will have won. Lord. Uh, no, uh, so where, where this concept of being unapologetic came from was that. was more about if I'm dating someone who's new to polyamory, I would tend to try to sugarcoat things. Mm -hmm. Try to like gently ease them into the concept that I'm also dating other people. Or, or maybe they know about the people I'm already dating. But if I go on other first dates, or I'm interested in other people... I would kind of, you know, you kind of gently sugarcoat that. You try to, because you don't want to freak them out, right? But I found that more often than not, that's achieved the exact opposite of what I wanted and backfired. Mm -hmm. Because then they either feel like you've been keeping things from them, which is yeah. not good and not generally a trait of healthy poly relationships, uh, or it's this shock later down the line and it causes the relationship to end when you're already really invested and it hurts so much yeah. more than if you had been clearer about that from the beginning. That I think people have a harder time actually with change in a relationship than they have with just a relationship being a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. An example of that that was given to me, uh, I guess this was in a, a blog that I read, where a guy was talking about, you know, he, he uh, started being polyamorous with his wife, and she will only have maybe a couple other partners and they'll date for a long time. She does more sort of like fewer, longer term, serious mm -hmm. relationships. And his girlfriend, he met at a sex party at a dungeon. And she's constantly at sex parties. Like that's her world. And what he was saying is like, if my wife were to just all of a sudden go to a sex party or want to do that, that would be a hard adjustment. Mm -hmm. I'd figure it out. But that would be like, I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how to process this. Whereas the other partner who's done it the whole time, whatever. It's not a big thing because that's always what I've associated with her. Mm -hmm. It's that change that's actually harder than the reality. Yeah. So that's kind of where this concept of being unapologetically poly, uh, unapologetic, is to just... Right from the start. No, no, this is not normal. This is not normal. I can't, <laughs> can't let you get away with this. <laughs> right? It's to just, you exactly. know, if I were using this term from the first time you met me, it wouldn't be a change. You're right. Be... <laughs> Absolutely. But now it is. And now it's no, really hard you. to take. I know. But, but right, it's, it's that, that idea that um, being as consistent as you can, as early as you can, even if it seems like it might be more shocking for them in the first place. I'm seeing so many hands. I love this. Uh, hands. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here. And then, up, oh. and then up front, and then in the back there. That's the order I saw them. I'm sorry if that was wrong. Was there another one, too? No. no. Okay, great. What, what is it? What, what is, wait, am I next? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. So what if someone is rekindling something from when you were previously um, monogamous or, like, you know, just experiencing that? So how do you kind of mesh those worlds of, like, I was once all about this, but now I'm about something else. I'm unapologetically who I am. 
but I still remember what it felt like to be all about you and kind of like rekindling like how do you kind of bridge those words like like getting back together with an ex that you used to be monogamous with exactly. okay uh, I mean that's just it's a lot of letting go of some old things <laughs> that's yeah yeah, yeah definitely no, I, you I mean, know you I, it. not impossible yeah no. actually I, I have a friend of mine who um uh, she broke up with her ex after several years together, like seven, eight, nine years together. Mm. Um, she was dating for a while. She got introduced to polyamory or non-monogamy by another partner, kind of started dating non-monogamously, met back up with her ex, um, mm. and they did rekindle their relationship. And the thing was that she found that their relationship worked a lot better non-monogamously because like a lot of the things that had not worked or that had been too much pressure or that had been deal breakers the pressure was off a little bit when they were both dating multiple partners so that was something that she found and then he fortunately also had the same experience i imagine if one person doesn't have that same experience it might be a little bit monopoly would be challenging in that situation yeah a little sticky yeah Yeah. i I do want to clarify too that with you know, change is the thing that's harder than just accepting that relationship as it is. That doesn't mean we can't ever have change and we won't, right? Like, you are going to have change sometimes, and it can be a little hard. But just, I almost feel like acknowledging the fact that it is hard with, Mm. you know, with that example of, like, just being really clear with each other about, I know this is going to be tough because we have all these habits from before that now we have to change. Mm -hmm. Even just that might be enough to empower you to to be able to make that change to a different thing. Yeah. Uh, I saw a hand right up here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think like it's like number six, like with an asterisk, right? This is kind of like free checking with an asterisk. The reason is, right? And the reason is like, I think that for people who perhaps don't have other people who they're accountable to, i.e. children, Yes. Right? Yeah, I mean, yes. we still live in a society sure. that doesn't fully accept us. This is a lot like being gay. Yes. Was not that long ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, from personal experience, I can tell you that there's still a lot of prejudice against oh, us. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And, and so while I think it unapologetic uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> would work in a dating s- scenario with people that maybe don't have children. Mm-hmm. Right yeah. and don't have exes who might be vindictive. Mm-hmm. Exactly. No, of course. Or yeah. might yeah. take them to the car. You know, might take them to yeah. task publicly. Yes. Right. So that, that it's, it's a little dangerous of free checking with you know, yeah. the thirty five yeah. dollar overdraft. Let me right. clarify something about that. Actually, yeah, is that like our, our our stance on being out? So this kind of being unapologetic and being out are a little bit different, actually. And we, I guess we should have clarified that. Mm-hmm. So thank you for, for bringing this up. Because absolutely, like, depending on your situation, it might not be safe to be out at work or with all of your family of or your partner's mm-hmm. family or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's something that there's a lot of great resources about how to evaluate if that is a safe thing for you to do. Uh, and I would highly recommend uh, Dr. Elizabeth Chef mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. She's done a lot of research, and she works a, as a, a professional expert witness, specifically for those kind of custody cases and that when it gets really shitty. Mm-hmm. But she also has a lot of great advice about how to avoid getting there in the first place. Mm-hmm. So this being unapologetic is more about in the places where you are out. Not It's not the same as being like out and proud. It's more about being consistent with your partners about that or being consistent with the people you are out to about not giving them more details than they might want or you know than they need but also just kind of being clear about it and not kind of trying to like withhold some information until later so but thank you for bringing that up yeah, that's be a safe great... about it obviously yeah yes. Yes. yeah we we always like urge people if you can come out do so that's sure. great but if it's not safe like don't no don't take yes. the risk like yeah. the, definitely the biggest threat right now to the poly community are these custody battles mm-hmm. that yeah. keep cropping up like that's that's been the the big thing is, mm-hmm. you know, a judge who, a vindictive ex 
husband or ex-wife um, kind of uses their ex-partner's non-traditional relationship. It could be polyamory. It could be being kinky. It could be involved in the BDSM community. Um, right. Uses that as leverage for trying to get custody of the kids. And some judge who has no idea what the heck your lifestyle is automatically assumes, like, well, you're doing this weird thing with multiple partners. You must be, like, having sex in front of children. Yeah. or and put. It works. And it works. It does, yeah. That's the unfortunate thing is that it works. Yeah, um, you know, so that's, that that's kind of why society. it's good that there's people like... Elizabeth Sheff, who is an expert witness, to come in and say, no, these are the findings of 15 years of research, that this isn't unhealthy, um, but there's there's not enough people like that in the world yet. There's not enough research like that in the world yet, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, so that is the very serious issue facing a lot of poly families. And that's also the reason why um, most people with children are not out at all, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, at all, um, which, is, which is an unfortunate... Uh, kind of scenario to be in. Uh, I saw some other hands. Did we cover it or, or did you? Yeah, you yeah. covered it. We heard at the Berkeley Poly Conference from Elizabeth Sheff. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. lovely. Yeah. That's awesome. Excellent. Yeah, she's, she's awesome. Really yeah, amazing. she's great. She was, she was on our show last year and, and uh, we're going to be having her back actually to kind of, because she's revisiting her her findings of yeah. her research, and mm-hmm. she's going to be back on the show to, to talk about that. Yeah, I love she's talking incredible. with her. She's yeah. awesome. Was there yeah. somebody else that we missed? Did we get everybody who had their hands up? Looks like it. Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, on to the last one. <laughs> yeah, last one. number Bring seven. Home. Yeah, okay, number seven, you guys. This is my favorite one. <laughs> um, so the things that I've seen in the most effective non-traditional relationships, uh, and all, monogamous relationships too, mm-hmm. honestly, is that each person in the relationship has a a little bit of zen. Um, And I say zen not to to proselytize for like zen Buddhism or any particular deity, but kind of more the concept of zen. Um, That usually it's, you know, people have some kind of emotional management practice or they have some kind of mindfulness practice. Um, This can be related to self-care as well. But kind of, and, and, you know, I feel like the little bit of Zen is kind of the through line that ties together all the previous six, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of having this sense of mindfulness, um, having this sense of inner peace or like some inner, um, like an inner foundation and inner grounding is what helps you to have compassion is it helps you to have self-awareness. It helps you to have that self-efficacy, um, and, it, you know, this one is also, again, it's the one that's hard to pin down, you know. Um, for me, you know, uh, uh, a, a completely essential part of my practice in having non-traditional relationships is my own personal meditation practice. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to do this. Um, mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be meditation. Any any kind of, like, emotional management system or any kind of self-knowledge system that allows you to kind of take a step back when you're in a moment of feeling jealousy or feeling fear or feeling anger, anything that allows you to take that little step back to be able to observe yourself. Um, Sometimes this is connected to the idea of there being, you know, I I know they do this in 12-step programs, but this idea of being um, connected to something bigger than yourself, and that could be the relationship, that could be your own personal growth as a human being. Um, But the idea of something that takes you out of those moments that feel shitty (laughs) essentially Mm -hmm. and to be able to realize you know that this is for my personal growth or I'm learning something here um, or I'm able to get through this I'm able to come back to a foundation I'm able to ground myself again Um, I don't know what your guys' access point has been for this yeah I mean my uh, partner runs 6k a day and that really I mean so often we hear about you know all of the stuff that you get from working out and it really is true it will help you just kind of get through those moments and sort of put it out there on the field or wherever um i do yoga every day um and that kind of helps me return to my breath and return to sort of the groundedness that i need in order to do this in a mindful way Mm -hmm. jace uh yeah i mean yoga is a great one Mm -hmm. i found especially i i have another partner who just recently she she has um you know will would often get depressed and upset and put that on me uh, you know, put that on her partners to solve that problem for her and got into doing yoga like six days a week nice. pretty intensely. And it's been like a night and day difference mm-hmm. uh, in terms of how she feels. And yeah. she said to me, you know, of all the things she's tried before, it's the one thing where she gets to kind of stop all those thoughts yeah. mm-hmm. that are sure. that are going mm-hmm. on over and over. Uh, I found for me, though, what's actually been the most effective is when I do... Um, like stream of consciousness writing 
uh, by hand, mm -hmm. not on a computer. Uh, that that for me, whatever it is, that triggers me to kind of let go of stuff, have it down on paper so it's not swimming around in my head. It's yeah. kind of whatever it is that helps you get it outside of yourself. Still those mm -hmm. thoughts yeah. a little bit because yeah. uh, it is really easy to get trapped in this emotional whirlpool or like an emotional feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Something that uh, Dedeker has talked about before that she's heard on meditation retreats that she's been on is that the feeling, like the actual physical feeling of an emotion, if you don't keep feeding it with thoughts about it, only lasts, and the numbers vary from like eight seconds to 15 or mm. like there, but yeah, it's, it's very a short. shockingly yeah, short it's amount of short. time. Yeah. Uh, and that, but what we do is we feel it and then we think about it and then we feel think it again and we think about it yep. and we end up in this cycle forever. Yeah. So having that mindfulness practice, whatever it is, having enough practice with it, and this one's hard because it's not like a quick fix right here, but having that be a regular thing that you do allows you to, when those things come up, it's almost like having a, like a circuit breaker in a feedback loop where it pops and you're like, oh, right, I'm doing that thing. <laughs> I need to take a moment to do my mindfulness, whether it's writing or you know, sit and breathe for five minutes mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and we also live in this fun day where there's lots of apps and things that can help you do this. <laughs> uh, I had this thing called a Spire. Spire is what it's called. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it clips on yeah, your okay. on your pants or or in your bra, and oh, is it, it the leaf thing? It, no, it, it tracks your breathing. Oh, okay. like it it measures, and it's uh, kind of amazing that it works at all. Like while you're moving around, you'd think it would totally throw it off, but it measures it and it goes to your phone, and it tracks whether you're in a relaxed breathing pattern, a focused breathing pattern, or a stressed breathing pattern. And you can set it to notify you. It sends you a very stressful notification to let you know that you're calm. You're stressed. <laughs> like, you're stressed. I, yeah, it would, it would like buzz and notify me when I was being calm. And I'm like, I know, but now I'm not. I turned, I turned that one off. Uh, but I did keep it so it would notify me when I was doing stressful breathing, which is characterized by kind of short, irregular breaths. Uh, and I would find that being mindful of it would help you be aware of that and, and calm it and be able to have some control over my breath, which allowed me to have control over how I was feeling. Yeah. And I found that number one time when I would get the most, like, because you can graph your day, it was driving. Mm -hmm. Stress, In stress, 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 yeah. oh, yeah. was driving. Yeah, <laughs> most of the rest of my day was pretty good with a few exceptions, mm -hmm. yeah. but it really made me aware of, like, oh, okay, this... You know, we all talk about, yeah, driving stressful, but seeing this is actually having a physical effect on my yeah. body yeah. was also cool. Anyway, yay technology. I saw, see a hand. Yeah. I think there's two things in here that I wish I had learned at your age. But one was, what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what is really going on as opposed to I'm stressed, I'm freaked out, you know, is it sad, is it, you know, is it hurt, is it angry, what is it? And then second... Don't believe everything you feel. Just like yes. don't believe everything you think. Yes. And that goes back to that point you were making about emotions. You know, are very transient in the, if you don't feed them mm -hmm. negative emotions. Yes. Um, yeah. So you know, I'm just very gratified to see such <laughs> no, wisdom. Thank you. So yeah. I need to be looking at him. You're what? Sixteen. <laughs> Her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, uh, to, to take it to a more serious note, um, that was one of the most valuable lessons I learned in my entire life was that feelings aren't facts and yeah. your thoughts aren't always true. Yeah. Like such a simple realization and just like opens up so much possibility mm -hmm. and so much space. Yeah, yeah truly and a amazing. Surprisingly threatening idea for a lot of people. Yes. yes. Yeah. Who want their feelings to be absolutely Always true. Yes. True. Like true. very solid. This yes. is true. Yeah. This is real. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a cool example that I heard about that in a psychology book that I read, and I wish I could remember the title of this one, but it was talking about. Uh, the physical sensation that you have when you're falling in love or, yeah. or when you meet someone you're very infatuated with, right? Like your palms might get a little sweaty. Limerence. Your, your limerence stomach, is what limerence, it's called. Yes. Yeah. Your stomach gets all queasy, like your mouth might get a little dry, right? Like those, yeah. your heart's racing a I mean, little bit faster. Terrible. It sounds awful, right? <laughs> well, here's the funny ever. part. If you, if you were to also list the symptoms 
of like a T-Rex coming around the corner. <laughs> your palms get yeah. sweaty, your stomach twists up, your heart starts beating faster, your mouth gets dry. It's all the same physical symptoms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just think of it in a different way. And there have mm-hmm. actually been studies showing that if you are having that physical response, uh, running on a treadmill is one of the studies that's been done, and then also doing like a roller coaster or a scary movie, mm-hmm. and then seeing someone of the gender that you're attracted to, you will rate them more highly on how attracted you are because your mind is interpreting your body's reaction as oh, like, wow. ooh, I must pee into this person because I'm feeling all these things. What if you fall in love with a T Rex? <laughs> then, then what? Good luck like with the that. Best then of, you're just this like the, the best, best the most worlds. purest <laughs> love ever. <laughs> That, it's the hottest attraction you've ever had. I haven't met that many T-Rexes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we got to start wrapping things up here. Before we kind of take it home, is there, are there any other questions, yeah. comments, anything? You guys anything? have been so incredible. It's a little story comment about energy. A story comment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Connected, connected to what you're saying. My personal experience was at one point I was absolutely jealous after opening. Mm-hmm. Devastatedly jealous. I went to a festival and I found myself at this festival one night completely with this rage in my belly. And I tried to say, okay, but what it really is, what really is, what really is, what really is. And it went down, 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 and became compersion. It became oh, yeah. sexual pleasure thing yeah. that my partner was making love at that time in another part of the county. Wow. wow. So wow. It, it seemed that I was, it came to like my in that thinking moment, about, it thinking about the T Rex and the, and the love. <laughs> 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 energy, yeah. energy, energy, yeah. energy. Yeah. energy. Is the story you connect to the energy can bring you one direction to yeah. the other. Mm-hmm. So even the feeling itself, I mean, if you bring it to the body, then you can somehow feel it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's, amazing. Share. that's wonderful. Yeah. Unapologetic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Love this. This, this uh, guy. Other, this is my like, guy. Any other non? I'll bring you to all the shows. You're my hype guy. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else before we take it home? Okay. okay. All right. Opportunity lost. So, um, <laughs> if you guys want to learn more about this, I happen to have just written a book. Um, it is woo, phenomenal. Um, I'm, it I'm just came biased, out. but it's it just really, came out on really Tuesday. Wonderful. It came out two yeah. days ago, um, and it's my baby, it. and it's been amazing. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah. I just, it came to me. <laughs> what, what is one characteristic that you would say that is the like kind of like highest regard you have over someone new. Like what is one characteristic of somebody that can just kind of blow you off your feet or like take your breath away? What is a personal characteristic that they would have? Yeah. Oh. They're wearing suspenders. <laughs> that's my personal no, one. I think that's actually true. I don't know though. if that's a characteristic. Yeah. <laughs> I think om- open mindedness. Open mindedness? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and suspenders. suspenders. Yes. I think for for me, it's the if something comes up where a person kind of shows that they understand that their thoughts aren't necessarily real, mm-hmm. like yeah, that. That's real hot. to me. Like that level of just being able to let go of having to. Yeah have all the answers even about yourself yeah. is just mm-hmm. like I think we could get along I think we could have a real conversation mm-hmm. uh, yeah I guess that'd be for me do yeah. you have a real answer besides suspenders I'm, I'm trying to think but no it's all suspenders up here like <laughs> no I no, I think it's that it's it's for me it is the last one it's like the mindfulness one mm-hmm. and it, you know if I feel like someone has this like self-awareness and uh I think a willingness to question things. I think yeah. I really respect that. A willingness Knowing to question assumptions, whether it's their own assumptions or other people's assumptions, that really that really blows me away. Yeah. I yeah. was sure to talk about meditation in my first OK Cupid message with with Dedeker years ago. <laughs> Good job. I knew how to speak. Clearly, it worked. <laughs> Um, okay. Oh, we wanted to shout out Paul. Our roadie, he is Paul. our roadie and uh, our lovely friend who is helping us here today and on the entire tour. Um, also to the Octopus Literary Salon. Thank you yeah. so Woo! much. This has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Oakland. Thank you, Oakland. Thank you, Oakland. Thank you guys are amazing. Nice.